Doctors, what patient made you go, how are you even alive, viewer's edition? Story one. Honestly, both my sister and my dad. My sister is a medical anomaly. She had broken multiple bones and stress fractures, had double knee surgery, multiple hip surgeries, her stomach stopped functioning to the point that she was barely eating 300 calories a day, had her gallbladder completely stop functioning in the middle of the night, developed sudden seemingly permanent paralysis, and nearly non-existent circulation in one of her legs, developed seizures that coincided with the problem with her leg, is in constant pain, has been in a wheelchair on and off since she was a teen teenager and has POTS and EDS on top of it all. She is 23, and the best part? She currently does wheelchair fencing! She is a legend! My dad, on the other hand, grew up in the country on some land with his siblings and parents. He was a reckless idiot. Once, when he was a little, he climbed into the hayloft and fell about two stories and landed directly on his head. Kay's there in a daze for a minute, got up and walked off with what probably should have been major head trauma and a broken neck. He and his dad once decided to burn some dead chickens in their old well, and the methane resulted in them accidentally blowing it up. It exploded with enough force to smash rocks through their metal barn 100 yards behind them and blasted them both about 10 feet backwards. His mom and sister came racing out in the family truck in tears because they thought my dad and grandfather were dead and they would have to collect their bodies. My dad also fell off a ski lift as a teenager and dislocated and slammed his shoulder back in three times when falling down the side of a ski slope and just got on the bus with the rest of his family like nothing happened. He woke up not able to use his arm and when he got feeling back he just sort of left it? He's over 50 now and it has finally started to bother him. His true medical miracle happened right before his wedding though. My dad was driving his little black Toyota Celica on the highway a few days before he and my mom were going to get married. Suddenly an 18-wheeler that wasn't paying attention slammed into his car and rolled over the top of it, totally crushing it with my dad inside. He only survived because that model of Celica had a steering wheel that collapsed inwards, leaving him precious room to curl inwards and avoid being killed. My dad climbed out of his destroyed car and was idling by the side of the road in a daze when the police ran up to him and asked him where the driver of the car was, since they couldn't find his body in the car and assumed it had been flung out through the smashed windshield. When my dad told them he was the driver, the cops panicked and rushed him to an ambulance. Despite his entire car being pancaked by a semi-truck, my dad got out of that car with some bruising from his seatbelt and some minor nerve damage to his face from where it hit the dashboard. Everyone that saw the car afterwards couldn't believe that anyone could have survived it, and if he had been driving any other car, he would have died. First off, your dad is some kind of immortal, or managed to pull, like, a reverse Final Destination. I don't know what, but I, how your dad has managed to do all of that is kind of amazing and makes me feel like oh, I don't know if everyone should hang around him because it'll keep you safe or if just he pushes that luck bad luck onto other people I don't know I guess oh I'm either way d weird um and also to your sister wheelchair fencing that's amazing and i'm so sorry for all the stuff that she's had to deal with but it sounds like she is as you say a friggin legend so go her story two this is my uncle's story. He joined the army straight out of high school back in the late 1960s to get himself as far away from the small town he grew up in as possible. Two months after he left boot and was at his first assignment, some big shot colonels start coming out asking for volunteers for a new program called Halo Jumpers. These men would jump out of planes at 30,000 feet wearing oxygen masks and scuba gear, drop ridiculously far, open parachutes, then swim to their objective and do what needed to be done. Any private third class, my uncle's rank, that volunteered for this program would receive a promotion to private first class and would get a bonus 50% pay increase. My uncle thought it was a pretty good deal and volunteered. He went through a bunch of training and then they started doing practice jumps without all the gear over land to accustom them to jumping out of planes and using the parachutes. 
They jumped out in pairs in case anything went wrong. My uncle's parachute didn't open, and his reserve parachute also didn't open. His buddy jumper gestured him over and grabbed onto him. They tethered themselves together, and then the buddy opened his parachute, and it failed. So did his reserve. The two of them realized they were about to die and told each other it was an honor serving with them. And then miraculously, my uncle's reserve parachute opened. They were too close to the ground for it to slow them to a safe speed, but it did keep them from hitting the ground at terminal velocity. My uncle landed on top of his jump buddy. The jump buddy died on impact. My uncle untethered himself from him, stood up, and walked away without a scratch or even a bruise and called in a medical emergency. When the ambulance arrived, the medics kept asking him, where's the other guy? Where's the other guy? They refused to believe that he was the other guy. From then on, everyone called him Merlin because he must have been a wizard to have survived jumping out of a plane without a parachute. Later, it was found that the jump buddy had been sleeping with the wife of the guy who packed their parachutes, and he'd purposely sabotaged the chutes to make sure he fell to his death. He had to sabotage both the jump buddy and my uncle so that the jump buddy couldn't grab onto my uncle and use his parachute. The guy who packed the parachutes died in prison 10 years later. My uncle is still alive and well to this day. He teaches military history and tactics at West Point. Okay, that sounds like the story to like what one of those uh, military based crime scene investigation murder shows or whatever. But that's wild and also like so lucky in the end that that shoot opened for your uncle. Not so lucky for the other guy, but like, can you imagine like resigning yourself to death at that point and all like. I'm just, I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around it. Story three. Not a doctor, but a relative. My wife had a disc herniation that wasn't surgically corrected in time, so she had major neurological problems afterwards. After surgery, she was mostly able to do anything she wanted again, except for working. She is an early retiree. For several years, she could live a relatively normal life, besides some back pain when she did too much. That was until two years ago. The first time she noticed something was wrong again was when she was on a weekend trip with her sister and all of a sudden she tripped and fell. She didn't think too much of it until it happened again. She said it felt like her leg just gave way and stopped functioning. After much hassle with doctors who blamed her weight for it, yes, she is overweight, but that is not an explanation for everything. She found a doctor who ordered a CT scan. It seemed that during the back surgery, the bones and gristle had grown and were now pressing on a nerve responsible for, you guessed it, motor functions. So in July last year, she underwent another back surgery. After the surgery, she complained about massive headaches, and given that this wasn't her first proverbial rodeo, she knew that they managed to damage the cerebral membranes again. She had that happen once before. However, the doctors claimed that it was just her back and that she needed physical therapy. My wife agreed, especially after the headaches disappeared on their own. However, over time, she gradually noticed the back felt swollen. Her movement was limited. She felt like a massive blanket was over her brain, clouding her conscience, and sitting was painful, to say the least. Unfortunately, her attending physician got severely ill, so she again had to look for another physician. Last week, another doctor who examined her sent her to the hospital straight away because he said that during a CT scan he did, it looked like either one of the metal rods that had been implanted had broken or something else was amiss. At the hospital, they did an MRI and every doctor was shocked. It turns out that spinal fluid was leaking into the surrounding tissue, creating a pillow of 12 by 5 by 3 centimeters. That's 5 by 2 by 1 and a half inches. Having a small leak the size of a pea is problematic already, causing nausea, headaches, balancing problems, and other similar neurological deficits. They wondered how she could manage to do anything given that a leak this massive would cause major problems since the brain would sink due to the loss of pressure. She will have to return to the hospital soon to get this fixed and hopefully will be symptom-free in the future. I'm at least glad to hear that you and your wife managed to find doctors who actually diagnosed it right and weren't just dismissing it because of her weight. And I am also glad to hear that, you know, it sounds like she'll be okay and hopefully symptom free in the future because what a wild thing to learn. Like, hey, the thing that's wrong with you should have killed you by now. And to have to wait to get that fixed must be 
a little bit nerve wracking. So I hope everything's okay. Story four. My granddad is a Vietnam vet. He had been captured by Viet Cong, got horrifically tortured for several months, branded with hot irons, stabbed multiple times, teeth pulled out, got bitten by poisonous spiders, waterboarded, and dozens of other things. He was rescued by special forces who were doing an unrelated mission. When the doctors saw him, they refused to believe he was still alive. Half of his wounds were almost rotting from infections. He'd lost nearly a fifth of his blood and was deathly underweight from being starved the whole time. He went from 200 pounds to just under 95 when he was saved. His left leg and right hand were both amputated. His division's leader saw him after all of the surgeries and told him he was a effing damn robot. My granddad was medically discharged after he was healed enough to be taken back stateside. He's 73 now, has 7 kids, 39 grandkids, and 18 great-grandkids. Story 5. February of this year, I was diagnosed with leukemia. The dentist originally caught it, as while cleaning my teeth, my gums bled profusely for no reason. Absolute bloodbath. The dentist tells my mom there's something wrong and I need to go see a doctor. Before this, I had been experiencing extreme fatigue, tiredness, constant headaches, and was barely able to get to the from class to class at school. But I thought nothing of it. Two days later, we went to the doctor and I told all my symptoms I've been having that I hadn't told my mom about until then. They ran my blood, and that night at midnight, my mom had to come home from work to take me to the hospital. My hemoglobin was only 3, my platelets were 0, and my immune system was absolutely nothing at that point. I was admitted and was there for 6 days as they pumped 8 big bags of blood into me over those 6 days. Me, my family, and the doctors still wonder how I hadn't passed out yet with a hemoglobin of 3. I'm happy to say I'm now going into maintenance, sorry if I spelled that wrong, which is the final stage of chemo and will be done with treatment in June 2024. Wow, what a thing to get caught by a dentist. Like, it, it, kind of lucky that you went to the dentist. Makes me think that I need to go to the dentist. I have not been in a long time, but that's beside the point. What is important is that I'm glad that you're, you know, going into maintenance and that, uh, that hopefully you'll be done with treatment by 2024. And I hope that you're still watching and, you know, give us some updates. I hope things go well. Story six. I was the patient in this scenario. When I went to the ER for back pain, the doctors could not figure out what was causing all my symptoms. They drew blood. I got scanned by practically every machine in the hospital. The blood work came back and turns out I have an infection causing multiple organ failure. They got the organ failure early, so I have no lasting damage from that, but what should have killed me is my cholesterol levels at the time. I was in the upper 300s. I don't know what units were used. And apparently that was a really bad thing. I was given high doses of some antibiotics for the infection and other, other medications for my heart and cholesterol. I went from being at death's door to perfectly fine in a few days. Story 7 I'll add my own story from my dad, since it's one that I'm surprised never made international headlines considering what he was nearly killed by. My dad was sick in the 70s, and no one in his family could explain why. Goes to the doctor, who also can't ID the disease and sends him to the hospital. They also had trouble isolating it, so they had to do a procedure to better ID what was infecting my dad. He said he had no memory of what happened between the procedure and leaving the hospital, but what they ended up finding, to every medical professional's horror, was that he was infected with the Spanish flu. But not just any version, it was the one with the nearly 100% kill rate. The one that was prevalent in 1919 and vanished with no trace. They expected him to die at any moment considering how long he was infected for, but from what can only be described as a God-given miracle, the flu actually disappeared. He had to return a few times to make sure it was gone, and he's now mid-50s. Story 8 I don't know how I am not blind. When I was one or so, I had a stapler or my brother's pocket knife or something, I don't remember, nobody was around, and I came into my parents' room with a gash in my eyelid. My parents work at bars and they worked all night, so they were very tired. They looked at me, thought I was just scratched, and would go to the ER next morning. Next morning comes around, they take me to the ER, then realize that it wasn't just a scratch, it was a gash that went slightly into my eye. They somehow did surgery and I'm only half blind in that eye. 
My other eye is about the same from just bad genetics, but currently I only wear contacts. Again, I was one. I may be missing out on some details, but I'm just glad I didn't go fully blind in that eye. You know, there are two kinds of parents in this world. There are parents who see their kid get hurt and they're just like, ah, I'll be fine. They'll bounce back. We'll take care of it in the morning. And there are the parents who see like their kid with a scuffed knee and are like, oh my God, get the car, start the car. We have to get to the hospital. Uh, I'm sorry that your parents, well, I guess honestly with what you had getting there sooner might not have done anything better to help, but, uh, I, uh, I am glad that you are not fully blind, and I hope you're living life to the fullest. Story 9. My family has quite a few such stories. After many, many hospital trips, we've learned that the men in my family have abnormally thick skulls and reduced sensitivity to pain. My brother was taken to the hospital after his twin put a hoe, garden tool, in the back of his skull. I walked into an ER on a broken leg after a work accident. I thought it was just a twisted ankle, but my boss insisted I get checked out. My uncle didn't even bat an eye when we had a finger amputated by a piece of farm machinery. Just walked into the hospital carrying his finger and they sewed it back on. The real kicker, though, has to be my wife's mother. She had been admitted to the hospital on unrelated issues and found that her blood sugar was over 600. If she gets down to normal levels, she gets weird. Story 10. Not a doctor, but a patient. I have a lot of diseases slash health issues, and one time my doctor got a new nurse and had to copy all of my diseases for the commissary to see that I can't serve in the military. Nurse literally started yelling, stop, that's enough, while we were only halfway through and gave me a sad slash horrified look. Also, I remember telling one of my friends from med school how sometimes my condition worsens from time to time and how it feels like. Turns out I had four microstrokes, three of which I didn't even call an ambulance for and ended up passing out. Pretty much any person from the medical field I've told that didn't believe me, but then I would tell them about symptoms, what diseases I have, and even show an actual documented visit to hospital during my first time, and they start believing. The funniest thing about it all is that an untrained eye can't even say I'm unhealthy, because you really have to pay attention to minor details in my appearance or behavior. I even managed to live a normal life because so many of my conditions have improved enough where I started exercising that I'm on the same level as a normal person, but much stronger than people like me. Story 11. Not a doctor, but a patient. This is one of my favorite stories to tell ever. December 28th. I am at a sleepover with two of my friends. I was 12. We were out playing in the woods in the snow and I start getting cramps around my middle. I just started having my monthly cycle, assigned female at birth, and didn't quite have the schedule down, so I figured it was just a little early and thought nothing of it. They'd be gone in the morning. We'd get inside, we'd eat, we'd hang out a little more, and i tell my friends about the pain, and we go to sleep. December 29, I wake up. It is not, in fact, gone, and is, in fact, worse. I have no appetite for my breakfast, so the father of the friends assumed I just caught something outside. I go home, it does not die down. I tell my parents, they're trying to figure out what's happening. They call my grandfather a doctor to get his help. They can't figure out what it is, so they call the hospital just in case and get an appointment scheduled the next day. I don't eat, I don't sleep, I turn down doing all my favorite things, watching cat videos on their phone, playing video games, what have you, and the pain continues to get worse. December 30th, they took me to the hospital. They try to figure out what went wrong. They run a few tests on me that I can't quite remember, offer pain medication, which I turned down, I thought painkillers were placebos, and schedule an ultrasound the next day. As soon as I get home, they start pumping water in me, and because I'm not sleeping, my dad and I pile up in the living room chairs and watch a bunch of shows. We cried at the finale of one of them. December 31st, mom takes me to the hospital, I walk in from the parking lot on my own power, refuse pain meds again, rate the pain 8 out of 10, and so on. They lay me down for the ultrasound, and it's an ovarian cyst the size of a basketball. Doctors start marveling over how I'm even effing alive and instantly get me into the ER. Puts me on the IV, gets painkillers into me, and I'm in laparoscopic surgery within the hour. January 1st, my resolution is to never let that crap happen to me again. So I have had friends who have had ovarian cysts 
And the fact that you had won that size and you were like managing as well as you were is impressive as heck. I literally had a friend pass out from the pain of an ovarian cyst. It's scary. And so, yeah, just... Yeah, please, stick to that resolution. Don't let that happen again. I hope it never does. Story 12. Was 15 and got very sick. Symptoms very similar to diabetic emergencies. Finally went to urgent care for labs and was admitted to the ICU immediately for severe neurotoxicity. Lithium levels were so high that I should have been in cardiac arrest. Literally could not move on my own. The nurse was lifting me up. Could barely talk or understand anything going on around me. Didn't sleep for four days, so was having basically every kind of hallucination possible and also got sleep paralysis and lucid nightmares. My vision was off and my entire body was numb too. As a female, it messed up my monthly pretty bad as well. Had to get emergency kidney dialysis and everything. I still have a scar on my neck for where they inserted the central line. The doctors were scared too, and it takes a lot to scare the doctors, lol. Somehow, though, my kidneys and heart were completely fine. No damage at all, and I had a long recovery period, but had no permanent brain damage. Developed PTSD and had to go off lithium, which messed up with my moods and mental stability quite a lot, but I no longer take life for granted. That's my story, lol. Story 13. My grandma was one of the high blood sugar stories. She once called my mom and told her that the thing which she measured her blood sugar, don't know the actual name, was broken, as it only displayed HI. My mom completely freaked out about it, as that meant a blood sugar well over 500 or something, and was so confused why my grandma didn't have any symptoms whatsoever. They took her to the doctor, and she was fine. Another story is one of my mom's friends. It's more a surprise find than a how-are-you-still-alive story. He bumped his head into an iron bar and had to go to the hospital to check for a concussion or something. They did an x-ray and discovered he had a brain tumor. He went through chemo and almost gave up on himself, but he's fine now. Story 14. My assistant orchestra director in high school had one of those moments. He was working out in the oil drills with no civilization for at least an hour and working in 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit. They ran out of Gatorade and are running low on water when he finally passes out due to heat stroke. Next thing he knows, he's in the hospital and spooks the nurse when sits up fully awake. When the doctor talked to him, the doctor had to explain that in simple terms, he had such an extreme heat stroke that it was a miracle he was even alive. My assistant director couldn't move his legs at all due to extreme muscle spasms and his ankles were spammed out so much they were trying to break themselves. He was also having spasms in his arms. They managed to give him the electrolytes and water needed to get him fully functional again. Of course, my assistant director fully recovered. And as a side note, this was the kind of man who had seen some crap from getting hit with a shotgun slug in the shoulder to having his eye bashed out of his head to his older brother having a lawnmower amputate his toes. And my assistant director was the one to go out and collect them so they could be put back on. And they actually managed to. Ugh, heat stroke is no joke. And boy, oh boy, do some jobs treat it like, oh, just make sure they got a water break every couple hours. Like, no, sometimes you need more than that. Like, it's so dangerous. People still die from that working construction, even like a UPS driver did because of not having AC. D be careful, folks, when you're working out in the heat, please. Story 15. My appendix was so swollen and infected that the doctor called multiple after doctors into the room to see if he was not seeing things. Apparently it was so big that it's a surprise it didn't rupture at all. The reason I came in alone was because I had this annoying stinging in my stomach for a few days. It didn't hurt, it was just a permanent feeling which was annoying. Yeah, so that was the appendix, but according to the multiple doctors, I should have been able to stand up from the pain alone. Mild annoyance. Yeah, I got to call my parents before I was rushed into the ER immediately. Another day I got diagnosed with diabetes, they measured long-term sugar levels, and the doctor explained the values to me. In his words, the scale stops there, and there's a really good reason it stops there. You're point two under it. Oh, okay, so I was this close to apparently straight up dying from undiagnosed diabetes. 
Story 16. I was born a month and a half earlier than my due date, premature baby. I was born weighing two pounds and was basically the size of my father's hand. According to my mom, she was really sick when pregnant with me constantly, and if she didn't have me at that moment, she and I would both be dead. Since I was so sick and small, we both had to be transferred to a hospital farther upstate. Apparently, I was losing weight fast because I wasn't breathing. The doctors kept me in the NICU for a week on oxygen machine to keep me alive. One day, I yanked it out of my nose and was perfectly fine. I was sent home around a week or so later with my mom. Then I'd been diagnosed with scarlet fever a few months later and survived that. Rare for a baby of only a few months old. I think being born prematurely has caused some of my now health issues, such as syncope and my asthma, but besides that, I'm perfectly fine. Story 17. My doctors find me to be a medical mystery, lol. I've had some pretty serious spine problems most of my life, but over the last few months, it got much, much worse. We finally got in for an MRI, and after just glancing at the MRIs, the tech called my spine specialist and said to get me in ASAP since I had major spinal protrusions. During the follow-up, the doctor told me that looking at my MRIs, I should not be able to walk, and I should not have control over my bowels. However, I have full control of my faculties and can walk, albeit with a cane, but still a walk. Going to get surgery in just a couple weeks to cut out the part of my discs that are protruding. In one part of the MRI, you can't even see my spinal cord since the disc is almost completely cutting it off. They have no idea how I'm getting along as I am, with only a couple tramadol a day as well. I'm pretty sure it's just pure willpower since I've had to learn to walk five times already in my life, and I don't want to have to do that again, so I simply refuse to lose that, lol. Story 18. A story that happened to my brother. We lived in Italy at the time, military family, and went camping with a bunch of other American families. Basically rented out almost half the campground for all of us. First night, everything seemed fine. Morning of the second day, my brother complains that he's hot and tired and is going back into the tent to take a nap. Our parents thought that was odd, but let him be until he was asleep and there for like three hours. They got him up to examine him and realized that he had a high fever. We somehow didn't have the medicine pack my mom always brings on trips, and no one else thought to bring meds, and we couldn't go to an Italian hospital, so... Our family decided to head back to the base where we all stationed so we could treat my brother there. A three-hour car ride later, we're finally home, got my brother medicated, and my mom noticed he had this full-body rash as well. Mostly out of curiosity, she googled it, and everything that came up said he had scarlet fever? The long-dead disease? We ended up taking him to the hospital the next day, and one of our nurse friends that worked there saw him and ended up saying, yeah, this is a classic case of it. Brother got to be a med student lesson of how unchecked fever can literally morph into scarlet fever. Apparently he had strep throat originally on that trip, and just in time to realize he was sick and get home with no meds was enough to trigger it. He's fine now, thankfully. We were told that for the next few years he would be susceptible to strep throat, and I'm pretty sure for like four to five years after that, every winter, he would catch strep again. I don't think he's had it since, though. I'm glad that everything turned out okay, but it is kind of wild just how bad, like, an untreated fever can be. Like, sometimes we see people get, like, a fever or something, and it's like, well, get some rest, and, you know, it'll break, and you'll sweat it out. But it's important to remember that, especially for young kids or really, you know, elderly adults and stuff, fevers can be dangerous. They can even be dangerous for just normal, healthy adults if you're not careful. So, you know, don't just treat them like nothing, you know, take some precautions, folks. Story 19. I was getting a bilateral tubal ligation because I didn't want kids, and the surgical tech later told me after the surgery he yelled, what the F? when I was opened up because they couldn't find my uterus or my right fallopian tube. I had so much scarring in my abdomen that there was a web of pink everywhere, literally linking most of my organs, but confirmed to link my GI tract and reproductive system. They had gotten the left tube out, but went, nope, and stopped at one. But the source of the scar tissue was from surgery that required me to have a tube put in from my head down to my abdomen as a newborn. As I grew, the tube uncurled like a fire hose and it caused scarring. 
Best part, in the early 1990s, best practice dictated not to use anesthetics or painkillers of any kind on newborns, and I had a 5% chance of having full function of my brain and a 10% chance of living past two years old. I graduated college and am mentally okay in the intelligence department. Gifted even. Just depressed. Story 20. I owe my life to the nurse who told me to come to the hospital again when I called on a Sunday to ask if my boyfriend could swing by to pick up more pain meds. She found it concerning that my pain had not subsided since my visit to the ER a few days earlier, so I survived a decaying-slash-necrotic gallbladder to the point it had burst and its contents had started leaking in my abdominal cavity. It was so infected that they couldn't even fully measure how much toxins were in my blood. After emergency surgery to remove the stinker, I had to stay until the infection was as good as gone. I was not told any of this until afterwards. And when I asked at my checkup a few days after discharge what would have happened if I wouldn't have been ordered to the hospital that Sunday, the doctor said my organs would have failed one by one pretty soon and I would have died. Pretty shocking to hear, so I shed some happy tears on my way back to my car. During my further recovery at home, I binged iZombie and joked a lot saying I was a part-time zombie myself. It's not every day you get a dying organ removed. I've dealt with uh, the pain of gallstones, and it was some of the more intense pain I've ever had in my life. But the fact that yours, like, burst and was leaking all of its bile, I, I almost said gallstone juice, but I remembered bile at the last moment. Um, but... <laughs> The fact that yours burst, I can't imagine how painful that was. So glad that you went in. People, go in to the doctor if you're in extreme pain, please. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.